right, tonight we are going to do what we usually do on Sunday night, which is cover a different subject, which is something having to do with creation. So tonight we're going to have a lecture on the evidence in molecular biology for design. It's called Compelling Evidence for Design in Nature, Why Evolution is Not a Candidate. Now, as I've told you, I, uh, I have a PhD in molecular biology, even though I'm working in geology and paleontology. And for, for many years, that seemed like a, an anomaly. It just didn't go together. And yet today, there's a lot of molecular biology that's being done on paleontological specimens. So it turns out that it is a fortuitous uh, crossing of, of disciplines. But what we're going to talk about tonight is what we learn by looking at the complexity of, of modern molecular biology, what it tells us about where we came from. So let's begin by just examining the evidences. There are some evidences that seem to favor creation and some evidences that seem to favor evolution. Radiometric dating, for example, is something that seems to be in favor of evolution. There are other dating methods also that give us long periods of time. The fossil record has some features that are difficult for creationists to understand. Why do we have an orderly fossil record with certain organisms at the bottom and other organisms higher up all the way to the very top? There's also the hominid fossil record, the fossil record of man, which is a, a challenge for creationists. And there are other things that we can name. But there also are data that appear to favor the biblical model of creation. The origin of life is the biggest of these. Origin of life is the most challenging aspect of science today for those that believe in evolution. Because without having a mechanism to get life here without God, evolutionists are hamstrung. They really can't even get started on evolution if they can't get life. And after working for nearly 100 years, trying to decipher how life could have happened by accident, the best we can do today is suggest that, well, maybe it started somewhere else. Maybe it came from outer space because we sure don't see it, how it happened here. And of course, that's a cop out because we already have made the most optimistic assumptions possible when we're trying to do that kind of research here. And then to say that it happened somewhere else just, just uh, hides the problem. So that's a very, very serious problem. And if anyone wanted to talk to me about evolution, I would certainly bring that up. A second aspect of of the data that's a challenge for the evolutionists and in favor of creation is the sudden appearance of life forms in the fossil record. When we go through the fossil record from the Precambrian going all the way through stepping through the various parts of the fossil record, we find that virtually all phyla, all the major groups of organisms are recognized right from the very first rocks that have uh, metazoan life in them, complex life forms. And uh, from there, they diversify, but all the forms are there pretty much simultaneously at the be very beginning of the Cambrian period. Another problem for evolutionists is the lack of intermediate forms in the fossil record. Evolution demands a sequence of events that lead from a single-celled organism to man. So there should be a lot of forms in between that step out the process by which evolution took place. That's not what we see in the fossil record. What we see is an organism exists for a while, and then it ceases to exist, and something else exists. And it ceases to exist, and something else exists. And it, there is no indication in the fossil record of the transition from one form to another. The few cases that evolutionists will cite are the horse, the evolution of the horse, where there are some seeming intermediate forms, and uh, the formation of whales from, from uh, four quadrupeds, from four-footed animals. Those have been uh, pushed very hard as examples of 
what happens in the fossil record. I can best cite you the work of Donald Prothero, who's a retired, recently retired paleontologist from Ox uh, Oxnard College in Southern California, who incidentally is very antipathetic to creationists and sympathetic to evolution. So he would not want to say something to help creationists. But what he said was, on his blog, he said he spent his whole life studying 160 taxa of mammals. 160 different taxa in the tertiary of mammals. Looking for evidence of change. And his statement at the end of his career is that of 160 taxa of mammals, only one showed any indication of change from the time it enters the fossil record until the time it disappears. And that was a slight difference in size. So basically, evolutionists will talk about stasis. Stasis means no change. And yet evolution has to mean change. So we have this conflict between what evolutionists want to see and what the fossil record gives us. Then there are data in sedimentology and catastrophism that seem to support the creationist model. And we'll have a subsequent lecture on that subject. But tonight we're going to talk about what I believe to be the most compelling argument from science, and that is from molecular biology. But in reality, you ask, why are not all the data on one side or the other? Why do we seem to see some kind of a, a balance between the data that support creation and the data that support evolution? We might want to see something like this, or if we're evolutionists, we might want to see something like this. But in fact, what we see is this, a balance between the data that support creation and the ones that are antipathetic to, to creation. So what does that mean? If you're able to do complex math, like A equals B, uh, if you have the same quantity on both sides of an equation, what happens? They cancel out, that's right. So for those who know science, the ones that know the science, the decision about origins is always going to be based on something other than science. So. Science can't tell us where we came from. The data from science cannot compel us to believe one way or the other. So if we want to believe in creation or we want to believe in evolution, we're going to have to go outside of science to get that framework for belief. Uh, for example, the Bible. Or if you're uh, a non-believer in the Bible, it might be some uh, philosophy of origins other than creation. So that's our starting point tonight. Science cannot give us the answer to this question. However, science can give us evidence that supports one view or the other. So let's take a look at some science. This is a fossil trilobite. I got this from a, a physician in Spain who is a aficionado of trilobites. He has the largest collection, third largest collection in the world. And he has a lot of trilobites in his house. They're crawling all over the place. And this is what they look like. And, and trilobites are very complex arthropods. Arthropods are insects. Trilobites are arthropods. They're in the same alliance as insects and crustaceans and spiders and all those organisms that have hard out outer skeletons. Trilobites have a very complex structure. They have compound eyes. Here you can see their compound eyes. They have swimmerettes on the underside. Uh, they have antenna that come out the front. They have all the complexities of any modern arthropod. And yet they're one of the first organisms we see in the fossil record with all these complexities already there. So what we're going to do is we're going to use the trilobite as a metaphor for this complexity. And we're going to look at this diagram here. Here you can see the trilobite. And Notice that all of these major groups of organisms are connected below this dotted line. That dotted line separates data from no data. There are no metazoan fossils down here. There are metazoan fossils up here. And the metazoan fossils we have up here are of things like trilobites and other 
kinds of organisms, mollusks, and so on. So here's the challenge that we're going to address. If you find some complex molecular biological process going on in a human, over here in the anathostomes, and you find that the same complex molecular biology, biological process is going on in a fruit fly, then evolution demands that that process have been present in the common ancestor of fruit flies and humans down here. Any other explanation would demand that the same process happen twice. And we can't even fathom how it could happen once. How can we have the same thing happening twice? So if it were not true that the common ancestor had those characteristics that are common between a human and a fruit fly, if that's not true, then that would falsify all of modern molecular systematics. So we're going to accept <coughs> that that's true. <coughs> Excuse me. We're going to accept that that's true, and we're going to watch the consequences of that. So if we find that something a human does is also present in a fruit fly, that means that that was present in the common ancestor down here, and that means it must also have been present in the trilobite, the first organism we have in the fossil record, or one of the first metazoan forms. Is that clear? So we can attribute very complex molecular biology that we find in true flies and humans back to this common ancestor, and from there we can go to the trilobite, which we see down here in the fossil record. Does that make sense? You follow that logic? So we're going to be able to look at the molecular biology of a trilobite, even though they're extinct. We don't have any trilobites today. We're going to be able to see what went on inside their cells. OK, let's start with something simple. This is a ATP synthase complex. This is a cell membrane. What does ATP do? Okay, that's exactly right. It's the ATP is the material that inside the cell keeps you alive from moment to moment. In fact, it is the ATP synthase that's disrupted when people are exposed to cyanide gas in the gas chamber. I don't know that they do this anymore, but back in the old days they used to put people in the chamber and they drop some cyanide pellets into acid, it would generate cyanide gas and they'd die. They died because that cyanide disrupted the ATP synthase and prevented the formation of ATP. So it's, it's very, very close to life itself. This is what it looks like. This is a model. <clears throat> this is the membrane, cell membrane. And these structures that you see are all protein molecules. And this structure that looks like a, a motor back here, that's the armature of a motor, that's made of 12 protein molecules or so, forgotten the exact count. Uh, and this is a shaft, and the shaft turns, when this turns, the shaft turns, and this is the stator over here that holds this steady, so it doesn't turn. So this shaft turns inside there, and it will generate ATP molecules. We're going to watch how that happens with a model. But let's first just take a closer look at this. We can take this part out in, in some experiments, very easy experiments. We can pull this out, and we can glue it to a slide. This is a glass slide down here. Uh, these are histidine amino acids that are attached to that protein, and the histidine amino acids attached to the slide because the slide's been coated with metal ions. So this metal ions attract histidine, histidine attaches to the slide, and so this thing's sitting upright on the slide. Then we take a, the largest protein in the body, which is uh, actin, the muscle protein, the longest protein in the body, and then we attach some fluorescent dye to it. And here's what you see when you add some ATP.
It's spinning around just like a motor. Yes? How do you see that? In a microscope. But isn't it smaller than optical wavelengths? Uh, the light is light. And the molecule that you're seeing there is an actin molecule, <coughs> which can easily be seen in a light microscope. Okay. All right, now we're going to look at a model. And what you're going to see is this. I'm going to prepare you ahead of time so you'll be able to follow it. You're going to see a membrane. That membrane is the mitochondrial membrane. Outside the membrane, you're going to see plus charges. Those represent hydrogen ions. And those plus charges are going to jump onto the armature of the motor. And they're going to travel around that as it turns and hop off on the other side. So they can only get on over here from the outside. And they can only get off over here on the inside. So they're constrained. If they want to go from outside to inside, they're constrained to ride the merry-go-round. And as they ride the merry-go-round, it turns. And as it turns, the shaft turns. And as the shaft turns, we make ATP. OK, so you're going to see this in the model. OK, here it is. Notice the concentration of hydrogen ions is higher outside. So they want to get inside. They're going to jump onto this structure here. And they're going to jump off over here. Now watch what happens up here. We take a molecule of ADP and an inorganic phosphate and jam them together physically so that they form a chemical bond. And now we've made ATP. That's the process that keeps you alive from moment to moment. You have billions of these things inside your cell, inside your body. All these little motors turning away and cranking out ATP. Is that amazing? Yes. How fast does that go in real time? Um, I don't know the answer to that. Sorry. OK, now, you want to see that again, or did you get the picture? I got the picture. OK. All right, let's watch it again. OK, here are the hydrogen ions on the outside. And they're jumping on here, and they're jumping off over here. They want to get inside, because there are more of them outside than inside. That's the process of diffusion. So diffusion is what keeps us alive. You may think diffusion is not a very important part of life, but that's what keeps us alive. And uh, there you made ATP. OK. That ATP synthase is present not only in fruit flies and humans, it's present in every living organism, from bacterial cells to humans. It's present in every living organism. It's a motor. It's as complex as any motor that man designs, electric motor. And that electric motor is keeping us alive. And how can you get an electric motor like that, with that complexity, formed without a designer, without a mechanism to make proteins? Uh, is ATP synthase also found in bacteria, or is it just? It's found in all living organisms. There are a few bacteria that don't use ATP as a power source, but they still have the motor there. It just okay. does something different for them. Yes? Would that be considered a type of free energy? Well, free energy is involved in, in the process, and that's, that's the diffusion. The free right. energy comes yeah. from diffusion. All right, let's try something a little more complex. That was just a warm up. Uh, we're going to move uh, another level, and we're going to talk about cell division. Uh, this is a chromatid from a human cell. These are microtubules that attach to a structure called the kinetochore on the, on the chromosomes. These chromosomes are condensed down so that the cell can divide and keep track of them. And you can see microtubules come and attach to both sides of the chromatids. And when they separate in the middle, these, these microtubules pull them off in opposite directions. We're going to look at that from several perspectives now. Here is a karyotype of a human. This is a, a human cell that's been squashed and, uh, the, during the process of cell division. Back in the old days, we used to have to use scissors to make these karyotypes. But nowadays, you use Photoshop. Isn't that nice? 
Okay, so each one of these chromosomes has four. There are two that are daughter chromatids because these have replicated and they're ready for cell division. This chromosome here, consisting of two chromatids now, this chromosome you got from your mom and this one you got from your dad. This one from your mom, this one from your dad, all the way down the set. So you are a unique combination of DNA that came from your mother and your father. And these things together make up you. Let's take a look at these chromosomes in a little more detail. Here, one of these chromosomes has been treated with detergent and it has caused the DNA to be released from the backbone of the chromosome, which is protein. This is a protein, uh, series of protein molecules here and here, each of those daughter chromatids. But look at this cloud out here. Do you know what that cloud is? That cloud is a single molecule of DNA. Here you can see a close-up of this little box over here, and you can actually see the thread of DNA as it goes out, loops out from the backbone of the chromosome and comes back to it again, and this process goes on and on. Now, that cloud of DNA is about 1.6 centimeters long. Uh, sorry, 16 centimeters long. That's about this long. 16 centimeters long of DNA, something like that, in one molecule that makes up one chromosome inside your cell. If you consider the nucleus of the cell to be the size of the Earth, there is enough DNA in the nucleus of one cell to go to the sun and back eight times. To the sun and back eight times. There is enough DNA in a single cell. If you consider the nucleus of the cell to be the size of a shoebox, it would be like having a shoebox with 2,000 kilometers of string in it. Can you imagine a kite string 2,000 kilometers long? That would be long enough to go from here to California and it's inside a box the size of a shoebox. That's what the nucleus of the cell is dealing with. Let's watch how the DNA has to be copied first. Here you see the DNA strand coming in from the left, and the DNA strand consists of two molecules. They're going in opposite directions. So in order to copy them, one of the strands can be copied straight away. You see that right here. The other strand has to be copied backwards because it's going the other direction. So this mechanism, this machine, copies that DNA flawlessly, even though it has to copy it backwards and rejoin it together to the strand. So this one's copied straight away, this one's copied backwards. And this, this diagram is going at about actual speed. This thing is turning at the speed of a jet engine. Yes. because they are going in opposite directions and the DNA dependent DNA polymerase only works in one direction. So it only copies from five prime to three prime and this strand is going five prime to three prime that way so it has to copy it backwards. But look at the machine, it does it, no problem. And it's going on right now in your bodies keeping you alive. Once you get that DNA formed, you've copied the DNA, now you have to wrap it up so that it starts to make sense. We use proteins in the body to do this. There's a set of eight proteins called histones. Yes? Is that video on YouTube so I can look it up? Probably. Um, this, this, uh, mo these molecules of histone here are the same across the whole spectrum of organisms. So a carrot in the refrigerator and your body have the histone H3 is only different by one or two amino acids. They're very, very similar across the whole spectrum of organisms. So the DNA is wrapped around those histone proteins. And we're going to watch that happen now in this visualization. Here's the DNA strand. You just copied it. It's brand new. It's now 16 centimeters long in a nucleus that is 10 microns across, 10 millionths of a meter across. So 
So here comes the histone proteins. The histone proteins wrap the DNA around themselves and make what's called a nucleosome. And then the nucleosomes form a series of six to form a solenoid. And then the solenoids supercoil once, twice, three times to make the condensed chromosome. Now all that DNA fits inside the nucleus. Now watch them. They're about ready to divide. Here you have this, the, the chromosomes all going to the center of the cell. When, when the last one gets there, a signal is given, and the, the, the kinetochores separate, and the chromosomes go off to opposite sides. The daughter chromatids become chromosomes, and now you have two new cells, each with a full complement of DNA. Now what happens if they don't do it right, if there's a mistake? What happens if they don't get there at the right time? What happens, how do they know when it's the right time to let go? Uh, like a, isn't there a protein that gets coded when they reach there? We're going to watch it. Here's, the, here's the, the problem now. You've got 23 sets of chromosomes, 22 plus the X and Y chromosome. You have one, one copy of each of those chromatids, so there's 46 chromatids. And on signal, every single one of those has to let go so that the chromosomes can accumulate on the opposite sides to make two new cells. If that doesn't happen right, the cell dies. If that happens often enough, you die. So let's watch it in detail. Here, again, the work of Drew Berry, a very talented molecular biological artist at Howard's, Howard Hughes Medical Institute. He used to be. I don't know where he is now. Here you can see the, the histone proteins surrounded by the DNA. Now we're looking just at one chromosome here. And what we're going to do is we're going to leave it behind and we're going to back out of the nucleus. So here you see the chromosome. Now we're going to back out of the nucleus. We're going to go through the nuclear skeleton, the nucleoskeleton, and then out a nuclear pore into the cytoplasm. And then we're going to see what happens to the cell. So here you see the chromosomes. The nucleus has now dissolved. And the chromosomes are beginning to organize themselves and moving toward the center of the cell. So that they come to lie on the equator of the cell. And then at a given signal, there it goes. A given signal. They know everybody is there. Off they go to opposite sides to make two new cells. Two perfect cells each having a full complement of DNA. Okay, now we're going to back that up. We're going to take one of those chromosomes, and we're going to look at it in detail. We're going to zoom in on the kinetochore and see exactly what's going on there. The kinetochore consists of about 200 different proteins. So itself is very complex. Here you can see the microtubules binding to the kinetochore. Microtubules binding to the kinetochore. And now we're going to zoom in and we're going to look at the kinetochore in detail. Here you see the, the microtubules being formed off of the kinetochore as they expand or contract. A lot of activity going on down here. We'll zoom in closer. That's the DNA molecules there. Now we're going to zoom right in, and you'll see the, the microtubules being formed to, to elongate. And uh, so this, this cell now has to let the other cells know when it's ready to divide. So when it senses it's in the middle of the cell, it's going to send a signal out 
And that signal is going to go to all the other uh, parts of the cell and let it know that it's ready. But it doesn't just float through the cytoplasm willy-nilly. Guess what? The microtubules are the highways of the cell. And the signal walks on the microtubules to carry the message that it's ready to divide. And there they go. Off they go, just like in a horse race. They aren't the only things that walk on microtubules. Microtubules are the highways of the cell. Everything's walking on microtubules from place to place. Here comes your messenger carrying the message, saying that it's time to divide. But there's lots of other traffic out there as well. Is that amazing? Let's take another look at uh, the cell. This is a modern depiction of a, of a cell showing some of the complexities in the, in, the in the cell and the nucleus. We'll take just the nucleus and blow it up and look at the nucleus. And what do you see here? You see nucleolus. You see the DNA molecules. You see these amazing pores. The pores in the nuclear membrane are very complex. And the pores are responsible for everything the nucleus does. If you can't get a protein or a DNA molecule or an RNA molecule out the pore, then you can't do anything with it in the cytoplasm. They aren't holes. They are pores. And the pores are very carefully guarded by a complex of molecules that we're going to look at in some detail. Here is a, a depiction of the pore itself. And here you can see how the pore is constructed. Uh, there's 456 different proteins of 30 different kinds that come together to make that pore. The membrane spanning proteins are the first ones. And they begin to form the opening of the pore. And then they begin to pick up other proteins. And the whole thing can construct itself. And every time a cell divides, the nucleus dissolves. The nuclear pores dissolve. And then they have to form back in the new membrane. How do these proteins know how to build themselves? Well, they also, besides having a function which they do to, to keep the integrity of the nucleus, they also have information about where they're supposed to go and when, so that they can form this pore in short order. Because until the pore is formed, they can't do any activities. Yeah? So how do people manage to construct this reading model? That's why you want to go in molecular biology. They're very clever. And they have figured this out by labeling these proteins and then looking at the electron micrographs of the pore to see where the label is and a lot of other techniques like that. So uh, this, this ability to reconstruct things like this is dependent on a lot of work by a lot of people. All of that complexity of cell division is present in fruit flies. It's present in humans. Therefore, it must have been present in the common ancestor of humans and fruit flies, if evolution is the correct explanation. Therefore, it was present in the trilobite, the first organism we find in the fossil record. All right, now let's look at something really complex. Nervous system. This is a synapse. Synapses are very important. It's synapses that control our thinking, and our actions, and just about everything else. Synapses are really gaps in the, in the transmission of the nerve impulse. In these gaps, the transmission from one cell to the next depends upon usually a neurotransmitter. There are some electrical uh, synapses, but uh, it depends in most cases on a neurotransmitter that is released by the afferent cell. And then there are receptors on the afferent cell, cell that pick up those triggers and respond in appropriate ways. So when a impulse, when we put our finger on the stove and before we get a chance to think, oh, that's hot, our finger's already off there because of these, uh, because of these very fast synapses. So we're going to look at this in a little bit of detail. Uh, notice the parts of it. There's a 
synaptic cleft, that's the place between the two cells, which is open space. Up here are synaptic vesicles that release the neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter goes across and triggers a response in the postsynaptic cell. All right, let's take a little closer look. In order to have a nerve impulse, you have to have a depolarization of the nerve itself. Depolarization means that the normal uh, plus on the outside, minus on the inside, that normal charge has to be neutralized and go positive in order to have an impulse go by. The only way that we know that that happens is by the transmission of sodium from the outside of the cell to the inside. When the sodium goes from the outside of the cell to the inside, it causes a depolarization of the membrane and that depolarization is passed on along the nerve. Me mediating this whole process is a protein called the 24-pass voltage gate sodium channel protein. If you have a name that long, you must be a pretty impressive protein. It's impressive, all right. It goes through the membrane 24 times, in and out, in and out. Now, the synthesis of that protein is a miracle in itself because it has to be synthesized as it's synthesized, it makes amino acids in a sequence. Those amino acids themselves not only have functions in the mature voltage-gated sodium channel protein, but they also have codes that tell whether they belong in the membrane or out of the membrane or on the outside of the cell or in the inside of the cell. They have all that information coded into their, into their amino acid sequence by the coding into the DNA. So the DNA is not just making a simple passage through the membrane. It has to go through 24 times. All that instruction on how to go through the membrane, how to be made in the membrane, is contained in the amino acids themselves. Here's how we think it probably looks when it's mature. It forms into a channel. And the channel has a gate. And the gate responds to a change in voltage. So when it sees plus charges on the inside, it opens and lets more plus charges in. Those plus charges diffuse to the next pore. It causes that channel to open, lets more plus in, and that's how the nerve impulse, sorry, that's how the nerve impulse travels along the nerve. Now, if that's all there was to it, that'd be complex enough. But it's not, because once you have that channel open and plus charge on the inside, the channel can't close. Because remember, it's sensitive to voltage on the inside. So as long as there's plus on the inside, it remains open. That would be death for every one of us. We'd have one nerve impulse and that would be it. So that protein also contains a ball and chain. And the ball and chain, once the plus starts coming in, the ball and chain is attracted to the pore and shuts it off. Then the sodium potassium bump, pump pumps the sodium back out and the potassium back in and reestablishes the minus charge. The ball and chain fall off and the pore is now ready for the next impulse. Pretty complex. That's just one protein. That impulse travels along the afferent neuron by that process until it gets down here to the end. When it gets down to the end, there is a calcium channel protein there. It's also a 24-pass protein. And the calcium channel protein opens up and allows calcium to come in. And we'll see what happens then. Here is a depiction of the vesicles in the cytoplasm that carry the neurotransmitter. Here it is empty because it's been used up. The Membrane is recaptured by the cell, taken back into the cytoplasm, and then at the expense of ATP, it's loaded back up with more of the neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter then travels back down to the end membrane of the cell, where it's anchored and remains until a, an appropriate stimulus comes along and causes the release of the neurotransmitter. But it, but it doesn't just float through the cytoplasm. Again, here in these, electro, these uh, light microscopic shots, here is a, a microtubule here, and here are two of those vesicles, one there and one there. Here they are approaching each other. 
They're passing each other, exchanging greetings, asking how the weather is down at the other end. And here they go on past each other. Here you can see those two vesicles on the microtubules. They don't just float through the cytoplasm. They walk from place to place. And here in the most sophisticated molecular biology textbook on the market, you can see these proteins walking on the microtubule. Here is a, a ribbon model showing that process. This is the microtubule protein down here. And this is the kinesin molecule walking, taking steps along the way. Here is a space filling model here. Notice that each time it takes a step, it burns our old friend ATP. And here is a modern um, production showing how this takes place. Here you can see the steps being taken by the kinesin molecule carrying that big vesicle full of whatever it happens to have through the cell. This isn't just a depiction. This is the most sophisticated depiction that you can get. This was produced by Howard Hughes Medical Institute for uh, Harvard University. That's not the only thing walking on microtubules on legs. Here is a mitochondrion. The mitochondrion is the powerhouse for the cell. It doesn't just flow through the cytoplasm. It walks to the place where its product, ATP, is needed. So here you can see the little legs walking on the highway, taking the mitochondrion from place to place in the cell until it gets to where more ATP is needed, and then it dumps it out. Who knew? These little things are crawling around inside your cells right now, moving from place to place, just like what you see in the diagram. Yes? Because at various times during the history of a cell, different processes are going on. Maybe this, this particular cell is required to make an enzyme because she just ate dinner. So the mitochondria will go down to the protein synthesizing area and they'll release their contents. Meanwhile, the nucleus up here isn't doing much. It doesn't need that energy, but eventually it will. And so they'll migrate back up there to release their energy where it's needed. Here is the vesicle. Here is the synaptic membrane. Here, is the, here are the proteins that bind the uh, synaptic vesicle in place, ready to release its contents. And here is the Rab protein. The Rab protein is a shipping label. Each vesicle has a Rab protein in its membrane, and that that label tells it where it goes in the cell. There's a UPS guy down here with a scanner, and he scans that label. And if it's in the wrong place, he turns it around and sends it off in another direction. That's sophisticated. That's complex. And all these proteins that are present in the membrane, you don't want to use this once and throw it away. You want to reuse it, right? So once you dump the contents to the outside for a nerve impulse, you don't want to have to start from scratch. You want to take that membrane back into the cytoplasm, fill it up again, and reuse it. How does that happen? Well, right now, it's fused to the end membrane of the cell. How do you get it back? There's a molecule that does that called clathrin. Clathrin forms a cage around the cell, around the vesicle, and pulls it back into the cytoplasm. This is what the clathrin molecules do. And here you can see a depiction of that in this model. Here is the cytoskeleton. We're looking from the inside of the cell toward the outside membrane. Here is the vesicle. It's being recaptured by the clathrin molecules. They're pulling it back into the cytoplasm. And they will release it so that it can be filled again. <coughs> Okay, now they fall off. 
and the vesicle gets refilled. All, all of that complexity of nerve impulses is present in humans and the same molecules in fruit flies. All of it. That means that all of that complexity must have been present, if evolution is the explanation, in the common ancestor of fruit flies and humans, which must have existed down here in the Precambrian somewhere without leaving any evidence. That means that all of that complexity was present in the trilobite, the first organism we find in the fossil record. One of the first organisms. So we go from nothing to everything in very short order. What kinds of reactions have people had? Stephen Gould, uh, who died a few years ago, said fast is now a lot faster than we thought. Because you go from nothing to everything. And he says that's extraordinarily embarrassing. Is that what he said? Oh, he said interesting, didn't he? Samuel Bowering at MIT, we now know how fast fast is. And what I like to ask my biologist friends is, how fast can evolution get before they start feeling uncomfortable? Here you have nothing below that line and everything above it. Rudolf Raff, there must be limits to change. After all, we've had these same body plans for half a billion years. Ever since the very first organism, there are no new phyla. And Narbon says, what Darwin describes in Origin of Species was a steady background kind of evolution. But there also seems to be a non-Darwinian kind of evolution that functions. Non-Darwinian kind of evolution. Interesting that functions over extremely short time periods. And that's where how much of the action is? All oh, the action is. So what is evolution doing? Isn't that the whole monster theory? That's, that's what the conclusion you reach if you follow this logic is that everything is happening in no time. What does that sound like to you? Sounds like creation, that's right. So I, I've given this talk at many uh, secular universities, and uh, I have ended up with this slide. And again, I point out the fact that this line separates data from no data, data from no data. When the data are there, all the molecular biological complexity of the organism is also there. And down below the line, there's nothing. So what makes more sense to you? To believe that all that complexity happened with no data? Or to believe that maybe some amazingly intelligent being was responsible for forming these things and put it all together and pro provided it all in, in zero time? We would say that was creation. So if you believe in evolution, if you believe all of this arose without a divine guidance, you believe it on the basis of faith, blind faith, blind because there's nothing there. At least if you believe in the creator, you have a meaningful mechanism to explain what you see. Thank you.